talking to Hank Shen, who is known to be one of those people who actually have a high score on uh, Donkey Kong. Yes. And this time it's, yeah, well, the one who was a newcomer and um, who, who did beat the score of Billy Mitchell and Steve Wiebe. Yes. <laughs> so, hello, Hank. Hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see you already have the fitting machine, the Donkey Kong machine, uh, in the background. Yes, this is this is the machine that I uh, I broke the record. This is the machine that I set most of uh, the world records on that I had. Um, I think it, all but one were set on this machine. There was one I set at Fun Spot, but all the other ones were were set uh, set on this machine. All right. Um, so let's first start. Um, actually, you are a plastic surgeon. I, I, I read right. Yes, that's that's correct. So how did you actually start with um, video gaming with computers and um, and why did you decide to try breaking the world record on Donkey Kong? Okay. Well. Uh... Okay, let's see. What did have? How did I get into gaming? Well, first, I was born in 1974, so I was actually a little bit young for the classic arcade gaming uh, era. When in the early 80s, when Donkey Kong came out, I was only seven years old. So, and I didn't, I couldn't afford, you know, quarters of my own back, you know, back then. So, my first experience with gaming probably was uh, on the Commodore 64. And that was probably maybe 1984 or 5 when I had a, a Commodore 64. I don't remember when the Commodore 64 came out, but we probably got it a little bit late. So it was probably 84, 85. Yeah, it uh, came out in 82. In 82, I see. I see. Yeah, so I guess I was maybe two two years late. Um, but I remember we played, I, we told, I have two brothers, we told our parents that this would be for schoolwork. <laughs> but. It, <laughs> But really, we wanted it for gaming, so we uh, we played we played that thing day and night. Like uh, we we got the we got a lot of use of that. <clears throat> and then sort of uh, you know by the time I reached college, I, I I moved on. You know, the high school and college. You know, you move on to other things. Um, but you know, gaming was always sort of part of my life. Um, and then I would say back around the time after medical school, I would say after I graduated med medical school, I started getting back into gaming. Uh, and then by then it was it was more like uh, the PlayStation and Xbox Xbox generation PlayStation One Xbox Xbox the, the original Xbox. Um, so I'd kind of always been in, mainly a console gamer, I would say actually uh, uh, more so more so than arcade gaming. And then after after I finished my residency, you know, in in most countries, I think after you finish medical school, you can't immediately go into practice. You have to do a, we call it a residency. So after I finished seven years of residency, there was kind of this uh, uh, lull in my life, like uh, where I was trying, to, I was doing paperwork, setting up my office, uh, and you know, you would work, 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 and then you would wait, 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 and then work, 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 wait, wait, wait. So around that time, I, I finished my residency in 2007, and that's exactly the year King of Kong came out. So it was like perfect timing. I saw King of Kong uh, right when I finished residency. And then, uh, and I read about King Kong actually at EGM, which is the, uh, I'm not sure if it's still, I, I think it may have been discontinued. It's called, it's Electronic Gaming Monthly. I think it's an American console gaming magazine. Uh, but that's how I found out about King Kong. And then after I saw the, the documentary, I was thinking, hey, what's so special about this game? And, you know, I'm pretty good at video games. Why don't, why don't I, I was curious more than anything. I was like, why don't, why don't I see what it's about? So I started playing it on main, which is uh, uh, because I, I had no idea had no idea where where there there was a Donkey Kong machine, and I found out I was pretty good at it, but I, I didn't really have time at, at that point to um, uh, to play it. And then about a year later, 2008, when everything was was settled, and before my office had started, um, I, I started playing main uh, Donkey Kong on main uh, 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 more and more, and I found out I was really good at it. And after about three months, I kill screened it, and I was holy cow! Like, uh, 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 I kill screened the game of three. At, at that time, left hand kill screeners uh, on Donkey Kong, 
um, and made more, made more arcade. So after I killed it, I decided it was time to get serious. So I started looking for an arcade machine, either to buy or where I could even just play an arcade machine. And my original goal was actually just to record a kill screen, submit it to Twin Galaxies, and then be done with it. That, that's all I wanted. <laughs> But then uh, it, I'm, I'm the kind of person, I'm, I'm never satisfied. If I know I can do better, I'm going to do better. So I'm kind of never satisfied with, uh, you know, once, once I got a kill screen, then I realized, hey, I can do better than this. So then once I got a kill screen, then I was like, hey, why don't I go for a million? And once I got a million, it's like, you know, keep going. Once I got a million, actually, I knew I could break the world record because the world record uh, when I started playing was a million fifty thousand by Billy Mitchell. My first million was already a billion thirty seven. And I, I knew some uh, tactics to get more points. So I was, you know, 12, 13,000 points away from the world record. I said, I can't stop now, you know, like, uh, so it was only probably, it was only a few months after my first million that I got the world record. I, I knew I could do it after I got the million. The irony is I wasn't sure I would ever get to the million, but once I got to the million, I, I, I knew I could get the world record. So, you know, people think I saw the King Kong, I was like, hey, why don't I get the world record? It, it wasn't like that. It was kind of like a progression that, um, you know, like, why don't I see if I can get a kid screen, and why don't I see, why don't I see if I can get a million. Nowadays, the new players are a little bit different because they see that, like, uh, Billy Mitchell and Steve Weeby aren't, you know, like, out of reach. They, they, think, they think going in that, you know, maybe they can get the world record. So it, it's a little bit different mentality. But when you watch King Kong, you think this score is astronomical. They say, like, only, like, one or two people have ever gotten the kill screen, et cetera, et cetera. So you think it's, like, this impossible task. But now, now they're they're like uh, sixty, they're probably sixty something. I I, I lost count because uh, there are so many now. There's sixty something kill screeners, and there's twenty something people that can get a million, and there's about about ten that can get one point one million. So, it, it's 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 very very competitive now. It's very very competitive. I see. Um, so actually, you used the Mame emulator first and trained on that before you got the real machine. Yes, because I had no, I wasn't part of this um, arcade collecting scene. I had no idea. I had no. I, I I would imagine that there were people collecting these machines, but I had no idea like that there was, you know, there's this whole 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 world. You know, I wasn't part of that world, so I had no idea even where you could find a Donkey Kong machine in Manhattan or in New York City. So when I, it's funny because the what happened was when I got the kill screen. I went back to the Donkey Kong High score list, and I was finding finding someone that lived near me. And the first name that popped up that that lived in New York City, I you know I I, uh, I PM'd him and and I said, hey, where can I find like play or buy a Donkey Kong machine in, in New York City? And he said, hey, have you ever heard of Barcade in Brooklyn? And I was like, no. And then I googled the place, and I was like, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> and you know, the, I was there that that night, literally. I see. That's interesting. That, that's how I met. That's how I met Alexis. By the way, I met Alexis at Arcade. You know, it's not not every day you see a person in medical scrubs playing Donkey Kong at Arcade. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. Um, I also saw the movie, and I also spoke to her, and um, she said she she got interested in you because at that moment at that time she was thinking about making documentaries about interesting people and you were one of them <laughs> yeah i think the original plan was for her to the to, for her to make a documentary more about like the you know the, the sort of the regulars at that bar um but I, and i was the first one that she filmed and then after, I think, I, I'm not sure why she decided it, but after she filmed me, she decided just to, just to go with me and make it a short documentary. Yeah, it's an 18-minute uh, movie, and um, yeah. I should hold it in the camera. It's called Dr. Kong. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you signed <tried> one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got an autograph one from her, and I, I bought it. So um, well, that's, that's quite interesting. So... Um, let let me ask you, how did it feel to be the new guy in the field of um, Twin Galaxies and all this um, Kong off thing? Um, we will talk about that later. But I I know um, because I spoke to Steve Steve Weeby on the phone before, and he said that when he was the new guy, the problem was 
that the scene around the Donkey Kong was more, well, towards Billy Mitchell because they knew him. But yes. they weren't fond about the new guy, you know, is there some cheating exactly. involved and is he really capable of doing it live and so on. So what was your experience? Exactly. You know, if you watch The King of Kong, you, 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 get, you get this feeling that the people who are competing on Twin Galaxies, they all know each other and it's like this little, little clique of, of friends. Uh, and after I watched that movie, I thought I, thought I, I was going to get the Steve Weeby treatment, actually. I mean, my, my closest friends all, saw, all, all have seen me play, and they knew I was the real, the real thing. But when I, when, I, um, when, I, when I first broke the world record, I was thinking, you know, I'm going to get the Steve Weeby treatment. So I actually, it, it's funny because I, I, my first recording, I followed every single rule on Twin Galaxies to the letter. I mean, even the, the referees at Twin Galaxies were like, you did a really good job of that recording. Because I didn't want there to be any doubt that, that this was a real score. So, um, yeah, I, 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 took apart my, I took apart my whole machine. I showed everything, every part of the machine, because I, I didn't want to get to see it. But, you know, they're, they're still, I mean, I think in the very beginning, the people who didn't know me were quite, they weren't accusing me of cheating, but they were more wanted to see me play live before they, they made a judgment. But I think for the most part, I, I, was, uh, I, I had a warm welcome, especially from Twin Galaxies. I had a very, very warm welcome from Twin Galaxies. They didn't, they didn't doubt anything, actually. From, but Twin, Twin Galaxies has changed hands so many times since, since then. So, but the, the Twin Galaxies that I dealt with at that time would, uh, uh, gave me a warm welcome. I can't say... I'm not saying anything bad about the new, the, the new newer Twin Galaxies, but I'm just saying that my experience with the with that Twin Galaxies was very good. And it's it's interesting because I read that actually your original education is computer science yes. from the Harvard University and mathematics. So yes, I guess I... this kind of played into it. So because uh, Steve Weeby also did uh, engineering and he also did um, mathematics as a teacher, so. Yes. Is, is it like a similar background you have? I think, I actually find that a lot of the good Donkey Kong players have either a math or engineering background or computer science background, a lot. In fact, mo most, of the, most of the good players do. So I think there is something in the way of uh, thinking when you're playing Donkey Kong. When you're playing Donkey Kong, there, there's a lot of probabilities involved. And you, you can't really calculate. You, you just kind of have to, um, you just kind of have to guess, you know. Guess a probability. So, I think th there is there is a lot of math uh, uh, when you're playing Donkey Kong, but you don't have time to you know pause the game and <laughs> calculate the probabilities. You just have to guess, or by experience know you know which which risks are worth taking and which which risks are, aren't. Especially now the way the the high the world record has gone, you 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 can no longer play a safe game and get to the end. You have to start taking risks like unnecessary risks just for points. So. You kind of have to figure out which which risks. It's a risk reward thing. You have to figure out which risks are worth worth the reward and which which risks aren't. So, how did you actually take the approach of um, well mastering the game? Did you did you do your math knowledge um, like Steve Weeby at the beginning when you were using the emulator and stopping and trying to find out the pattern of the enemies, or how did you do it? Well, there, I mean, it's funny, when I first started playing, I wouldn't say I, I calculated anything. Well, maybe I, maybe I did calculate a few things, but, but for the most part, it was just kind of eyeballing, guess, guessing. Um, but in terms of the strategy, you know, a lot of, when I first started playing, a lot of times when, I, when I'd be going to bed, I would be thinking about strategies uh, uh, in my head while I was, going, while I was uh, trying to fall asleep. And sometimes I would get out of bed and, and try new things out. It, it, it's... Uh, you know, like in the early phases of Donkey Kong, I have to say it's, it, it it grabs you. It's it's, it's a little bit um, a little bit almost like obsessive. Um, you know, the the first I would say maybe first three months. Fortunately, I didn't have a job at that time. <laughs> the first three months that I played it, it really 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 grabbed me. I think after I got the first kill screen, I kind of backed off because that was like the that, it was a big sense of relief that that first kill screen. But yeah, it was mainly you know back then. Back when people weren't streaming their games, there weren't, you know, people, there weren't many recordings. I, I was, like, saving clips from here and there just to see how other, I, and I didn't know any, any other, like, serious Duncan players, so I, it was very hard for me to learn. I had to learn almost exclusively on my own. 
Um, the only other good Donkey Kong player in the, that I had any contact with in the beginning was uh, this guy named Benjamin Falls. I don't know if you've heard his name. Um, but back then, he was one of the maybe fewer than 10 kill screeners on Donkey Kong. So he, he was the only person that I saw play live, you know, uh, back then. Um, and forget about a million, I, I had no idea what a million point game looked like. I had no, no idea. Like, uh, so a, a lot of the, in the early days, uh, a lot of my learning was just, just on my own thinking in my head. Nowadays, everyone streams online. There's so many, you know, uh, so many uh, uh, recordings uh, that you can download. So it's, I would say it's a lot easier to learn now. It's still not an easy game, but it's, it's a lot easier to learn now. So would you think you are capable of doing it live on Twitch, for example? A world record, you mean? Yes, I mean, is that something you would do? Uh, well, n now that I know my internet works, <laughs> may, I, I, I have streamed games on Twitch, Twitch before. Uh, the problem with the world record attempt is even, even when I'm in shape, right now I'm out of shape, but even when I'm in shape, it's something that would take me maybe 100 tries. So, and each attempt is, takes, you know, maybe two, three hours. So this, you, you, you're talking about like, a, I have to stream every day for a few months in order to, to get a world record uh, on Twitch. So it is something I, I may, consider, may consider doing. I have done it in the past, but I haven't broken the world record on, on a stream yet. The, actually, the guy who has the world record now, Robbie Lakeman, he, he streams most of his games, and when he broke the world record, he wasn't streaming. So it kind of goes to show you, like, all of us do it. All of us who stream, we, we play games offline, too, because sometimes you just want to relax. You don't want to, you know, deal with the distraction of chatting with people on the, on the chat. So sometimes you just want to focus on the game. And I, I, I don't think it's a coincidence that he broke the record offline. I think when he was offline, he was more focused on the game rather than, you know, uh, talking to people on the chat. And so I, I don't I don't think it, it was good. I think he broke the world record twice. Now I, I'm not sure if the second second time was streamed or not. I know the first time it wasn't streamed. So well, so yes, beating the world record isn't really um, something you would call relaxing, and uh, <laughs> you know. So yeah, maybe that's that's a point there. But but you have your own Twitch channel, actually. Did I get that right? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. It's a, twitch.tv slash uh, Hank Chen, H-A-N-K-C-H-I-E-N. Oh, great. Well, so I will definitely look it up. And you use, so what do you stream sometimes when you are on there? Oh, I, I only stream Donkey Kong. Like nothing, nothing else I play is worth watching. <laughs> ah, okay. So you, so you never played any other games? Well, arcade games or, or just games in general? I mean, I mean, what, what other, what other C64 games, arcade games? I mean, any, any other favorites or is it just okay. Donkey Kong? In terms of arcade games, the Donkey Kong and Centipede are actually are my favorites. Donkey Kong and Centipede. Um, but I have a few, like there are a few arcade games that I really like, like Elevator Action I really like, or uh, um, like a Ms. Pac-Man Pac I really like. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's see, in terms of C64 games, this is a good one. I, I, no one has ever asked me about C64 games. Um, let's see, like a Jumpman Junior is one of my favorites. Um, let's see, uh, Ultima 4. Ultima 4 was probably the first RPG I, I ever played uh, on, the, on the C64. Uh, what else? Oh, the whole Summer Games line. Summer Games, Summer Games 2, Winter Games. I played all those lines. I was obsessed with getting the high score because, you know, in the early days, it wasn't often that they saved the high scores. I, I don't remember, I, I don't remember these days. It wasn't often that they saved the high scores in games. So at the Commodore, they would save the high scores uh, in the summer games. And I was obsessed with having, be, having the high score on every, every single event in every single, uh, uh, every, every, every single game. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Uh, and then uh, console games, console games, uh, let's see. Probably my all-time favorite console game is uh, uh, Super Mario Galaxy, uh, the original. Uh, I haven't played... Th there actually is Super Mario Galaxy 2, which I heard is just as good, but I, I, I bought it and I just haven't had, time, haven't had time to play it yet. So you are still a video game and uh, arcade gamer today, 
in your free time? Uh, yes, but the, the problem now is I'm having less and less free time because my my practice is getting busier and busier. So, and especially the end of winter is the busy season for me. So recently I've been very busy uh, and I haven't, I haven't played Dog Kong in months. Like, uh, that, that's why I'm so out of shape. And now, now things are, I can feel things are starting to get um, uh, 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 lighter now. So, and Richie, the, the next Kong off is planned for end of July. Which means, if I want to be a serious competitor, I need to start practicing soon. Maybe, maybe next month I'll start. Oh yes, it's interesting that you mentioned it. The Kong off I saw has a Facebook page, uh, facebook.com slash Kong off for. And um, tell us a bit about the Kong offs. What it is about? Okay, the Kong off is a it's a series of uh, Donkey Kong competitions. Uh, the first one was in, let me think, 2000, 2009, I want to say. I think the first one was in 2009. It's been almost every year uh, since, since then. It was started by a guy named Richie Knuckles, um, who, who, uh, who owns an arcade in New Jersey. Uh, his, his, the original idea was to get Billy Mitchell and the team maybe under one roof competing against each other in Donkey Kong. And he decided to invite like the top ten players and have like a competition. So it's been going on pretty much every year since uh, since since then. I I won the first Kong off, and then the second and third Kong offs were won by this Canadian named Jeff Jeff Williams. Um, and then the fourth Kong Kong off is this summer. So you actually won the first Kong off in 2011. That was. Was right. it 2011? Maybe you're right. Maybe it was 2011. Well, guess, uh, yeah. according according to Wikipedia, it was on March, the uh, from the night to the uh, of the 19th to the 20th of 2011. Actually, that sounds right because this is the fourth one, and it's been almost every year. So, two, yeah, 2011 is probably 2000. I think 2009 is when I broke the world record. That I think that's what I'm confusing. Yeah, 2011 was probably the first. First Kong off. So you will be on the Kong off this year too, together with Billy Mitchell and Steve Weeby. Well, I, I'm definitely. I haven't spoken to Billy Mitchell or Steve Weeby in a while, but I'll, I'll almost definitely be there because it's, it's in Pittsburgh, which is not not far uh, far from me. It's maybe a, I would say, I don't know, eight eight hour drive or so from from New York City. So it's not bad. I don't even have to take a plane. I hate taking planes. I'm not afraid of flying, but I, I just don't like dealing with airports and, and stuff like that. I see, I see. That's interesting because um, Steve Wiebe said he's more concentrating on family right now than mm -hmm. beating the world record. But mm -hmm. but you are still trying to beat the world record? Yeah, at some point I'm, I'm gonna try to get it back. I know I can get it back, but it's, it's just a matter of finding the time to uh, to do it. It's not even just the hundred attempts, it's it's the getting back into shape. Getting back into shape is gonna take me a few weeks, maybe a month uh, alone. So, um, uh, and then after I get back into shape, it, it's gonna be maybe a hundred attempts. So it, it's not it's not easy. And even if I, 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 I can't even play every day now, especially when I get back from work. Some, some days I'm just so tired, I just wanna lie in bed. Uh, you know, when I get home from work, and like you said, playing Donkey Kong is no longer relaxing. You know, when if you if you're just playing safely, that that's relaxing. When you're going for a world record, it's actually stressful. It's very stressful because you're taking all these crazy risks, and uh, and you have to keep your eye on like five things at the same time. It's it's uh, very very stressful going for a world record. It's frustrating too. It, it you know sometimes you 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 take a calculated risk and it doesn't go your way, and it's and you you mess up like a good game. It, it's it's one of the most frustrating things. Um, yeah, it's interesting. So, actually, how do you prepare for a session of Donkey Kong? I mean, uh, the only thing I saw in that short movie was this: like, you have two officers, and they mm. and you you make them call each other, saying, "No, no, no, he's busy or something." <laughs> That's the only thing I've seen in the movie so far about that trick. Well, I I I I've since quit the other office. One of the offices is my own. And the other office, I'm an employee. Um, but after my own office built up, I, I quit the other office. So I, I can no longer do that trick, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, but in, ter in terms of preparing, I mean, there's not much. Like, 
not not much to do. I mean, I always get a glass of water because I know it's it's going to be a few hours. I always try to go to the bathroom right before. Um, I try to drink maybe half a cup of coffee because I find that that that's about the right amount to keep me alert, but not not make me jittery. Because sometimes if I drink too much coffee, I you know I start to uh, tremor. I, I have I get a tremor. So, um, uh, but there, there's not much. I don't have like many superstitions or any, anything like that. Oh, snow days. For some reason, I do well on snow days. <laughs> <laughs> When when you can't drive and the roads are blocked and no no uh, customer will will ask you to well get there yeah. and I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence I think it's it's exactly what you said when when it's snowing you don't want to go outside you can't work you can't do anything so you're locked at home and what do you do you play Donkey Kong like <laughs> so I, it, it, you know we, we joke around that it's it's you know the luck of the snow but I I, I think it's more more has to do with the fact that you're locked in at home you have nothing to do so. Uh, you might as well go, go for a world record. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, well, so actually, how do you do it with that emulator and real thing? I mean, I spoke to Walter Day before, and he said one of the reasons they have separated um, high scores for emulator and real machines is that the control is different. And actually, yes. Steve Beebe said the same. It's, it's easier on the keyboard then with the real joystick on our arcade. So how, how was it for you to transform your million kill screen to the real machine from the emulator? The, well, there, there was definitely a, an adjustment period because um, I, I remember the, my very first game of Donkey Kong on a joystick. I, I, think, I think I died. I, I think I died on the first level, literally died on the first level. Because you, you, you're just not used to, you're just, you're just, in fact, I remember after my third death, I was like, I was waiting for my fourth man, because, you know, normally you get a free man. And I was like, hey, how come I didn't get a fourth man? <laughs> and, oh, I didn't get the 7,000 points I needed to get the fourth man. But the, 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 I went through a few weeks where I had to adjust to the, uh, to the joystick. I mean, now the joystick is, is uh, more comfortable for me than the, the keyboard. I, I still use MAME to practice or, or try out new strategies, but uh, I'm actually more comfortable with the, with the joystick now. It comes more naturally to me. But I do feel there, I mean, generally speaking, there is a, uh, an advantage to, to the keyboard, a very small advantage. Um, but it's very controversial within the community. I think the, the problem is MAME emulates Donkey Kong pretty much exactly. Like uh, I can't, I don't see any any difference between Mame.com and Arcade.com in terms of the game. The the difference is the, um, the the like you said the controls, and even that's a little bit controversial. I, I, I there's no doubt in my mind there's a very slight advantage to keyboard. Uh, it's very slight, but it, it is significant because in Donkey a lot of times you have to go left right really quick, and on a joystick when you go left right really quick it, it takes a split second for you to jerk left jerk right. But on the keyboard, you can do it almost instantaneously because you you know you have two different fingers on the left left and right arrows. Like th this comes into play mainly on the barrel boards. And if you've seen the King Kong, you know you can control uh, control the barrels. And sometimes you want to control a barrel that's behind you, so you have to quickly jerk you know backwards to control that barrel, and then jerk back forwards to continue uh, continue going. So. There, there is a, a definite slight advantage, but th that's very, very debatable. I mean, some some people completely disagree with that. Think think it's think you know, no matter what the controls, it's it's uh, 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 it, it's the same. It's a it's the same same game. It is the same game, but I think that the controls do do matter a little bit. And then there's another argument that if keyboard is the superior control, then that should be what everyone's using, you know, like that, that then it should be a combined, you know, any, any control, any control you want, should the high score should be the high score. It's, it's a very controversial uh, uh, topic. Well, it's interesting I, I, that you talk about delays because, um, as you know, emulation and the USB port and keyboards, it's also causing a, a delay because the input signals are different in speed and so on compared to an analog. Uh, joystick, uh, well, technique on on a on an arcade machine from the 80s or 70s. Mm. 
isn't that kind of, well it should also be a bit of a delay because of the emulation and the usb and the technical limita limitations that you have no i think theoretically there is a delay but you you can't feel it in in MAME because donkey Kong is only 64k you know i think it's less than 64 it's like 50 something k it's like the total the, the whole code the whole whole game is only less than 64k so we're talking about a very very simple game uh, pro like in terms of programming wise, so you know, for modern day computers, they can run run that 64k really really fast. So, I think theoretically, you're right. There there must be a a, a, a slight lag, but you, you can't feel it at all at all in in that kind. I have to say there are some versions of MAME where I do feel a slight lag, but in the in the PC version of MAME, I don't I don't feel any lag for Donkey Kong. I see. Okay. Um, so, um, what I wanted to ask, let me think. Um, yes, well, so interesting thing point in the in the movie in that short movie was that a lot of people told you um, why 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 do you play computer games? No girls is no girl is interested in somebody who plays computer games. And actually, you made the statement like. I'm playing computer games, so I get a girlfriend. And yeah. at the end of the movie, actually, you presented you your girlfriend. So um, <laughs> you kind of broke the the image of the nerd who is lonely and uh, has no girlfriend because he's focused on playing Donkey Kong all the time or other games. <laughs> yeah, that, that that started as and that started out as a joke. Actually, the when I when I first. The, the way that came about is when I first broke the world record, uh, I was speaking to one of the Twin Galaxies referees, and the Twin Galaxies referee was like, you know, well, why are you playing Donkey Kong? Shouldn't you be out getting laid? And I was like, <laughs> I joked back, I was like, I'm playing Donkey Kong to get laid. But, you know, there, there, there's this line in in uh, The King of Kong where Walter Day says, you know, I wanted all the pretty girls to come up to me and say, hey, I see you're good at Centipede. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my line was sort of in, in response to that. But it's joking. I nowadays like uh, playing video games is not a sex is not a sexy thing. But but on the other hand, now like half I read somewhere even more than half of the gamers now are are female. And I think they're including cell phone games. That's why they're including games like Candy Crush, where like the majority vast majority of Candy Crush players are female. So I think if you include cell phone games, it's probably about half. I think uh, of gamers now are female. So, but yeah, the I the the stereotypical yeah the stereotypical gamer. It's not. I, I think uh, I think that image has been broken, <laughs> especially That's now. It's interesting that you mention Candy Crush. I mean, Candy Crush is like the Tetris from back then. Yeah. But yes. nowadays, I remember when I was a child, my mom played Tetris. You know. Yes. I find women, there are certain games that women really like, and the puzzle, the puzzle games is one that, that women really like. The puzzle, because Tetris is essentially a puzzle game too. Like the Tetris and Candy Crush, women really, really love that game. But you, you go to arcade and you, uh, you pay attention to the games that the women play, it's usually almost always Tetris or Miss Pac-Man. And, and Centipede too, actually. The women love Centipede too. And they love Pac-Man because of a whoop, 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 whoop. <laughs> but they like Miss Pac-Man. You know, there, there's a theory. I, I read this somewhere too that um, you know when people are picking characters for say like Street Fighter, you're more likely to pick a character that you can identify with. So I think the same thing applies with Pac-Man, Miss Pac-Man. I think the females can play more to Miss Pac-Man than, than to Pac-Man. So I, I bet even if it were the same games, females would gravitate toward toward the Miss Pac-Man. Um, yeah, well, so actually, how is it for you now that um, video games are so, you know, normal in the society and actually it was mentioned a couple of times that the game industry is bigger than the movie industry and the music industry together. Yes. So um, do you feel like now you are a famous part of the scene? Do you feel famous in a way? I, I I I don't know. Like it's hard to, you know. I, I'm. It's it's hard to say because um, you know I I didn't know how big this scene was b 
before I started playing. So I don't know. I, you know, I, I knew when I, when I first broke the world record, I knew there would be a lot of people that would come out and say, like, Facebook friend request me. And actually, one of the things I did when I right after I broke the world record, before I made it public, was I created a new Facebook account because I didn't want my Facebook account flooded with uh, with just like people I, I didn't know. So I created this fake Facebook account, which is now my real Facebook account, but I created a fake one just so just to keep the two worlds apart. So I knew that I knew I would become somewhat famous, but I, I it was actually bigger than I thought. I think I, I got a lot more media attention than that than I would have ever ever expected. You know, every every day there's a video game world record being broken somewhere, right? Every, every single day. But I I mean this game obviously has has more um, uh, gets gets more attention than than most games. Um, so I was expecting a lot of attention, but it, it kind of blew me out of the water. The, the first week, I, the first day actually after I broke the world record or after the world record was announced, I had something like twenty uh, uh, twenty voicemails on my uh, on my phone at work. I literally, literally had like twenty voicemails from, and I, I had to figure out which ones were real, which ones were not real. You know, I they were like. Like Guinness called, and I was like, "Is that real?" <laughs> like, <laughs> like Guinness Book, Guinness of Guinness Book called, and I, I was googling phone numbers. I was like, "Yeah, that looks real." <laughs> like, maybe I should call it back, or or like Fox, Fox called. Fox is like a television network in 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 the states. Fox called, and I, I googled that number. I was like, "Is that real?" I was like, "Oh, that's real too." <laughs> <laughs> and how is it in your daily life? Do people, when you walk on the street, recognize you? Like, hey, you are this guy who broke the world record, right? It, it, it's happened once or twice, I have to say. It, it has happened once or twice. But it, it's not like I get recognized every day. Like, uh, I'll get recognized at Parkade a lot, actually. At Parkade, I'll get recognized. But like, on a day-to-day -day basis, like, uh, no. But well, actually, what was strange, just today, just today I was, I was running errands. I was just, you know, like, grocery shopping and whatnot. And, and this old man passed me. And as he passed me, he said, me, Donkey Kong. And I turned around and I was like, did he recognize me? Or was this just a crazy man saying, me, Donkey Kong? Like, I have no idea. Like, I didn't, I wasn't going to turn around and chase him and find out. I was like, why did you say Donkey Kong? Like, uh, but I, I, I know I wasn't hearing things. So he definitely said, me, Donkey Kong. And I was like, <laughs> maybe he recognized me. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I mean, nowadays, um, a lot of people uh, who started playing back then are in their 60s nowadays, or even 70s. I mean, see Walter Day, for example. That is true. That is true. Yeah. I would say this man was in his 60s, so it's possible he recognized me, or it's possible he was just crazy and he was just like mumbling things as he passed me. <laughs> I, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting because the, the average age of a video game player is between 30 and 40 actually um, yeah. because because with the time flying by people are getting older but they yeah. are when they are older they are still interested in in video games or computer games yes. and they most likely wouldn't stop because yes. for most people on the planet it's a way to relax and to entertain yourself rather than yeah. chasing a world record <laughs> At some point, I'm gonna retire from Donkey Kong and go back to the relaxing part of the part of video game. I still play video games just just to relax, but now now it's more now it's more casual. You know, now I'll play like cell phone games or I'll you know, but I still have unfinished finished business with Donkey Kong. So before before I retire, I'm gonna get back at least once more. I'll see. And I, I told Richie, I promise Richie, as, as long as there'll be Kong offs, I'll, I'll compete. Uh, I'll compete in them as long as I'm invited. I guess. At some point, I'm probably going to fall out of the top ten. So, <laughs> or or who knows? I I mean, this. Who, as long as I'm invited, to, even if I stop playing, like seriously, maybe I'll just go just to be like a, a spectator. Um, have you have you been involved in promotion for that Wreck-It Ralph movie or something? Because I kn I knew that that. Um, that Steve Weeby was actually promoting it on, on the internet, YouTube, and so on. Did you take part in that as well? No, I think Steve, Steve Weeby is a lot more famous than I am because of, because of the King of Kong. So he gets a lot more of the mainstream uh, mainstream media attention. I don't, I don't get any, I get very little mainstream uh, media attention uh, because of that. The, I, I, 
I a lot of people ask me, were you in the movie King of Kong? And I say, no, I started playing after the movie came out. Like, there's no way I could have been in the movie. But I think, you know, Billy Mitchell and Steve Weaver are still the most famous uh, Donkey Kong players now. Even though right now they've fallen out of even the top 10. They're not even top 10 uh, scores anymore. But they're still by far the most famous, uh, the most famous players. But did you anyway watch the record, Ralph? And did you play Fix It, Felix? Yes, I, I did watch it. Of course I watched it. And uh, I have played Fix It. There's so many different versions. I don't even know. I played different versions of it. Uh, it it's, I guess it's, it's a fun game, but it's not exactly my type of game. But it, it, is, it is a fun game. There are actually different versions of it because I I only know of one and I thought it was just a ROM set released by Disney. No, uh, I think that there's like I, I found different versions on like Java versions online or or there's an iOS version too. It, my my point is it's not just the arcade. I'm sure there's a standard arcade version, but there's like an iOS version and a, like there's Java versions online things like that. Ah, I see. That is what you mean. Um, and actually, did you play um, Donkey Kong Jr. too, and and the other Donkey Kongs? Yes, I after I um, well after I came, became part of this scene, um, you know, people started inviting me to participate in like arcade competitions, or they figure you're good at Donkey Kong, you must be good at other things. So I I, I have started playing. I started playing Donkey Kong Jr. because it was one of these other one, in one of these other competitions. So uh, Donkey Kong Jr. Uh, I actually got good at really fast. Like it took me, I can't, I I long, I forgot what the count was, but it took me thir about 30 games to kill screen Donkey Kong Jr. Because I think it, you know, in name it counts how many games you've played. So I, so I know it took me exactly about 30 30 games to kill screen Donkey Kong Jr. And I think. I think the Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr. have a lot of similar code in them. So even though the feel is a little bit different, I think the principles are, are similar. And also, with Donkey Kong Jr., by the time I was playing Donkey Kong Jr., there were a lot of videos online, so I just watched what, what other people were doing. So I, I learned it learned it very fast. Um, Donkey Kong 3, I... Donkey Kong 3 is like completely different. It's, a, it's like the black sheep of the Donkey Kong series. <laughs> so I played that too. I, I, I don't really like it. I used to... Donkey Kong 3 is essentially a shooter. I, I used to think I was good at shooters until I met all these, you know, video like like hardcore video game players, and now like now I, now I think I suck at shooters. Like <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting because Steve Weeby said the same about the other Donkey Kongs. He said that the Donkey Kongs coming after the first Donkey Kong weren't really well very good, so he didn't like them either. Um, but did you actually follow the news? I mean, recently they released Donkey Kong Jr. for the C64 as a fan really? release. Really? <laughs> really? Yes. I did not know that. <laughs> so maybe so, you should so, check that. Out. Maybe you should check that out. So, so someone actually coded it. Yes. Uh, let me see. Let me see. I will. I will find it for you. Because because when I when I was doing the research, I just I just figured it out the other day. I think it was even earlier this this year. Let's see. Uh, Donkey Kong Junior. I, I have a C sixty four emulator on my computer actually. I oh, have. So a... so you could download it. Let's see. Donkey Kong. Uh, Junior. Oh yeah, here we go. <laughs> there are even tons of cracked versions already. But um, yeah, it was released in November 2014 by Mr. Sid. I will uh -huh. um, I will send you I will send you the link here. So may maybe maybe you would like to to check it out when you get the chance in your <laughs> emulator. Um, it it already got two thousand one hundred forty two downloads, so uh, it's it's pretty famous yeah. in the C sixty four scene. <laughs> but but I didn't cool. I didn't check it myself. Um, one thing I would like to know is actually when when you start with computer science and all that video games thing, why did you become a plastic surgeon? 
Okay. Well, the, the pl plastic surgery was actually never never my goal until the very end. Like it, it was kind of a progressive thing. You know, when I when I uh, when I was uh, in my final year in college, I explored different things. Actually, I uh, I was thinking about like going into, into tech or going to Wall Street or going to medical school. That that's what I was thinking. The medical school part was more, you know, like part of it was parental pressure, like. Um, uh, you know, every Chinese parent wants their kid to be a doctor. Uh, but part of it was also stability. You know, at, at that time, you know, Wall, well, Wall Street, Wall Street, Wall Street jobs are stable. But then there's this. At least my parents keep telling me, you know, when you turn 50, you're gonna get laid off because you know they only want you know 25 year olds who can work 80 hours a week. So that was called kind of always in the back of my head. Um, and then technology was kind of natural. I actually, I actually. Uh, uh, Got a job offer from Microsoft. I interned at Microsoft in my junior 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 year in some in college, and uh, when in my senior year they invited me out for an interview again, and they offered me a full time job actually uh, uh, after I graduated, but I turned turned them down uh, for better or worse. I, I turned them down, so I explored many different things, but ultimately I, I went with medical school because I I think I, I was always good at math and science, so it was kind of Kind of a natural, uh, natural thing for, for me to do, um, and you know I, I don't regret I, I don't regret uh, doing plastic surgery because I, I found pla I love I love I love my job like a plastic surgery is like the best field of medicine I think, um, but I when I went through medical school everyone was telling me you should become a surgeon because you have really really good hands, so um, I thought about it I, I really like surgery too but I, I didn't want such a stressful job, so. When I was doing my surgery residency, uh, you know, I spent a few months doing all the different subspecialties. And when I did plastic surgery, I fell in love with it. I, I love the people involved too. It's it's kind of one of these things that in medicine, like different specialties have different stereotypes. And the the plastic surgeons, I found that I got along really well with the plastic surgeons. So I mean, the plastic surgeons kind of like um, they're not not as intense as say general surgeons uh, because their lifestyle is a lot less stressful. Um, but at the same time, they're very smart, and uh, um, they're also like a little bit of a perfectionist. And I, I, I'm a little bit of a perfectionist too. So I found not only I enjoyed the field, that I got along with the people in the field also. So that's how I did my class. I love my job, by the way. I love it. So I, I don't regret becoming a doctor at all. But I think if there wasn't plastic surgery, I might have regretted becoming a doctor. But but because of this field, I love it. <laughs> You, you even made this connection in the movie, um, the saying, you are a good plastic surgeon because you are good at video games and you need the same fine motoric abilities and skills. <laughs> well, there, I wouldn't say I'm a good you know, surgeon because I'm good at video games. I think it's more of a correlation. It's kind of like saying, like being tall and being a good basketball player. You know, there, there's a correlation there, but it's not a cause effect. It's not that... It's not like it's not like being tall makes you a good basketball player. There's just like a, there's a correlation there. There's no cause effect. So th there definitely is a correlation. I think the common bond is like uh, both of them require good hand-eye coordination. And there, there's actually a couple of studies now that correlate video games, uh, video game skills with surgery skills. And every study that I'm aware of shows that there is a strong correlation between people who are good at video games and people who are good at Good at surgery, so I was actually in one of one of the first studies of that kind because the hospital I did my general surgery residency in it's, it's a it's called it's a Beth Israel in New York. One of the laparoscopic surgeons in that hospital he he conducted I think it might be the very first study of in that of that kind uh, because he was a video game fan too, so he had us play um, several video games. And then he had us doing surgeries, not 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 real surgeries, but like a, a sort of like a, they have these stations set up with like a, a like like pigskin, you know, and you would have to do uh, 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 like a simulated simulated tasks, um, not real surgeries, just like basic tasks like tying knots and things like that. So, and he found that there was a correlation between the people who did well in video games and the people who did well in surgery. So. There, there is, is, is not just uh, you know 
in my head. It's, it's pretty much been proven already. So as a patient, you should ask a doctor, are you any good at Tetris? Yeah, you probably should, actually. <laughs> like, if he's a surgeon, you should. <laughs> if he's a surgeon, you probably should. But, you know, it's interesting because now, you know, the, the, the gaming generation now is becoming of age where we're entering, like, we're, we're, we're now doctors and lawyers and, you know, businessmen, things like that. You know, the generation above us aren't really video game players, but, but our generation are, and we're, we're now becoming of age where we're, we're becoming, we're holding positions of power. And it, it's kind of like mind blowing to hear there's a surgeon who plays video games, you know, like, in fact, I know a lot of, a lot of my surgeon friends play video games. It's not, it's not a, a, a big deal to me, but to, you know, to, to other people, you, 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 it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't quite click that, uh, why, why would a doctor be playing video games? I, I play video games for the same reason everyone else does. It's, it's like a, a it's fun and it's a relief. Yeah, it's, it's entertaining. Yeah, it's nowadays, uh, nowadays a normal, common way to to relax yourself and to relieve stress. Um, yes. But but on the other hand, um, I think as a surgeon, you also have this problem that in a video game you you go game over and you try again. But as a surgeon, you only have this one chance to do good to your patient. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> You have to be a lot more careful when when you're doing surgery. <laughs> that is true. Is that not a, not a, not an issue for you, or or how do you handle that actually? Well, I mean, the, you know, the, this is going to freak patients out, but mistakes happen in surgery all the time. Fortunately, most of the time they're correctable, so it's not a and they're small mistakes. They're not big mistakes. They're small mistakes, but they happen all the time. You know, because doctors are human too, and you know, most doctors, especially the older generation, the doctors, they pretend they're perfect. They pretend they're God, right? But like, I think my generation takes a little bit of a approach. A lot of times, patients will ask me questions, and I say, I don't know. Let me look that up. I'll get back to you. like the older generation of doctors would never say that. But I think my gener my generation of doctors, I think, is more more likely to say that. And I think. The patients respond well to that because I think the patients know you. You don't know everything. It's impossible. You can't know every single, every single thing there is about medicine. Uh, and a lot, in fact, a lot of times people will ask me questions, and I'll say, you know, that's I, I don't know a lot about that. You know, you should see X Y Z specialists because they would know no more. You know, a lot of thing, a very common thing in my office is people will ask me about skin problems like acne, for example. And of course, I, every doctor knows a little bit about you know acne, but. Um, to, to do a really good workup, you probably should see a dermatologist. And I tell my patients that. I'm like, I could, I could easily give you, you know, some advice, but I think it's better for you to see a dermatologist. You'll, you'll get better advice from the dermatologist. And I think the patients respect you more if you say something like that because they, they'll feel more like you're being honest, that you're being a real person to them. So, and that's kind of the, the reputation I try to build in my own office, like as an honest and ethical doctor. Did you actually have the case that people were coming to you because you were breaking the world record saying like, I know this guy, I trust him because I saw him a couple of times and I saw the movie or I saw the news and he must be very good because he has such great coordination. Believe it or not, yes. The, I've had a, a few patients come to me through Donkey Kong. Uh, first, I was in a couple of uh, local newspapers in New York City, and I had a few patients come to me because they read about uh, they read about uh, me in the in the local newspaper, and they're like, "Hey, I need this plastic surgery done. Why don't I go to him?" Or the other the other thing I'll get is on the internet, um, people will be reading whatever website, and they'll they'll come across this Donkey Kong story, and they're like, "Hey, he's a plastic surgeon. Well, you know, I need this." So. Uh, I have gotten a few patients. The majority of my patients don't come through that route. In fact, the majority of patients don't even know I I, I had the Donkey Kong or had the Donkey Kong world record. So, and sometimes when I bring it up, they or it comes up, they they're they're surprised. <laughs> because they they wouldn't think you would have the time for that, basically. Yes, and also I have a lot of Chinese patients in my office, and the Chinese have this stereotype that if you're a video game player, like you're it's it's almost like being in a gang, you know. You you must be a bad person, you know. You you, mu you must 
Yeah, it's it's that kind of uh, stereotype. They think you don't do well in school, or you're a bad person, or you spend you know spend a lot of time playing video games and no no time working or something. But it's <laughs> it's it's a different you know it's it's different. I think American culture is a little bit different. It's more integrated in American culture, but Chinese culture still has this negative ne negative stereotype negative negative stereotype about it. I mean, I mean, if we're talking about cultures, think about the Japanese, who are even more extreme in video games than the Americans. Yes, yes. <laughs> but I, I think it's video games. It's like almost everything else in life. It, it's a balance. You know, th there are these people who get obsessed with video games and they play twenty four seven and lose sleep over and they and ignore their kids. You know that then you're going beyond. You know beyond like a normal just hobby or release like a, that, that's probably unhealthy but you know in, in medicine at least we, we say or in psychiatry we say as long as it doesn't affect your activities your normal day-to-day -day activities as long as you hold a job you're not late to work you know you know as long as it doesn't affect your normal activities it, it's completely healthy there's nothing wrong with it so you know, I've never been late to work because of Donkey Kong. You know, I don't. I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, uh, speaking about that, nowadays quite some people actually earn their money by um, earn their living by playing, well, um, real professional e-gaming leagues. Or, yes. Um, yes. I also interviewed the Fractals who are doing let's plays and competition for Ubisoft as um, as a female gamer group and they're actually getting paid to play video games yes. so yes. Um, it turns out to be um, a profession as as normal as others meanwhile yes. but I guess that is because uh, by the um, majority of people nowadays there are a way of video games and more and more people are playing them I mean I saw people in their 60s 70s in the tram or in the train playing on their iPhones um, video games you know <laughs> yes so the, you know I, I got asked that question recently have, have you ever considered about playing have you ever considered playing video games for, professionally for for a living and the answer I gave to that was that wasn't an option when I was a kid so I never aspired to be a professional video game player because that, that wasn't even an option when I was a kid now, now it, it's definitely an option. But I feel like, you know, being a professional video game player, it's, it's almost like being a professional athlete. You know, very, if you make it, you make it big, but very, it's a very small percentage that, that, that can make it. It's, it's very, very tough to be a pro professional video game player. I, I'm sure you've seen some of these documentaries about, like, uh, professional video game players. They, they, they it, it's a real job. Like, they, they practice and practice and practice. It's a, it's a real, real job. Uh, but if you make it, it really it pays it pays well. I think the the last DOA two, um, I think the grand prize was like one or two million or something. It's something crazy. I it went to a team, but still, one or two million. You know, like <laughs> most people. I mean, most people make that in a lifetime. They made it in like one day. You know, like well, I, excluding the practice. But I mean, you know, they made it in one competition. It, it's crazy what, what you can do now in video games. And I also think it takes the fun away. Uh, as soon as something is work, it's not really fun anymore. <laughs> I feel that way a little bit about Donkey Kong. When, when I'm playing for a world record, I feel like it's work. I, it's not. It's not that. It's not as enjoyable anymore. <laughs> but I, I do. I do feel that way a little bit about Donkey. It's still. It's still fun to me. But uh, if, if the day it becomes not fun, I'm, I'm going to stop playing. But it. But it does feel a little bit like work now. <laughs> Actually, what what are your future plans? For, for Donkey Kong or your life or your profession, do you have anything that is coming next? Any big goal? Um, well, I, I'm, I'm going to try to get the world record back. Uh, probably, I don't know, Kong of 4 is coming up, so I have to start playing for the practice for Kong of 4. So while I'm in shape, I might as well give it some world record attempts. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough time to to break the world record, but I'll, 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 give it, I'll give it a few tries uh, while I'm in shape. Um, I think, honestly, after I, re after I retire from Donkey Kong, I'm just going to go back to being like uh, just the average video game player. <laughs> I, don't, I don't really have any aspirations. I'm sure I could get world records in, in other video games, but it's, it's I don't know. 
I, I feel like for me, video games are more fun than burning setting world records. And unless I find a game really fun, uh, I'm not going to put in that much time to, to, to break a world record. You know, because like you said, it's going to feel like if you don't like the game and you're just playing it to beat the world record, it's going to feel like, well, you know, it's not going to be fun anymore. So, and then like, like professionally, you know, my, my office is starting to get busy now. So it's, 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 it's going to be harder and harder for me to play. So office wise, I'm in my sixth year of practice now. Um, so it's professionally, I think, I think I'm going to be okay uh, 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 with the office. Well, I mean, you could return when you retire in 30 years. <laughs> There's an idea. <laughs> well, I'm 40 now, so hopefully I'll be retired before 30 years. <laughs> hopefully I'll retire, I don't know, maybe in 20 years. Hopefully, I think, I always say it depends on how many kids I have. I think for every kid I have, I'm thinking I need to work five more years. <laughs> oh, you actually have kids? No, I don't. I don't. I'm not married. I'm not married. But I'm saying if, if I don't have kids, I could probably retire when I'm 55. And if I, for each kid that I have, I think I have to add five years to that. So if I have one kid, this is how I'm thinking. This is, I haven't done the numbers, but this is, this is my guess. If I have one kid, I probably have to work until 60. If I have two, I have to work until 65. <laughs> if, do, you, do you actually have plans to, to build a family? I think it's something I eventually want, but it's not, I don't have any immediate immediate plans. I'm 40 now, so I should start start to get the ball rolling. But I I don't have any immediate plans now. I guess you you are never too old to to start video gaming. I mean, when they are grown up and moving out of the house. I mean, I we we know all that uh, King of Kong documentary. I think there was this woman about uh, I don't know 72 or something, and she was playing on the Cubert um, yes. uh, high score. So yes, she had the five man Cubert world record for a while. Actually, it, it's been beaten since. It's been beaten since the King of Kong. You know, the King of Kong started this sort of a surge, this like revival of classic arcade games. And because of that, a lot of classic arcade game world records got broken because people, after they saw the documentary, they're like, hey, I used to be good at, you know, Cubert in the 80s. Why don't, why don't I see if I can get a world record on that? So a lot of classic arcade, like major ones too, got broken uh, uh, recently. So, but I, I don't know, like, Donkey Kong, when, I, when I'm 60, I, I, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking my reflexes are going to be too slow to be playing Donkey Kong. Like, Donkey Kong is a game where it, it looks slow, but there's a lot happening on the screen at once. There's a lot happening. And you have to, have, you have to think fast and you have to act fast. So it's, I don't think, it's, I don't think I'm going to be any good at Donkey Kong when I'm 60. <laughs> well, also the problem is... Um... With Donkey Kong, what I figure from the all the different versions, uh, for example, the one of those C sixty four versions, it's a lot different, and yes. I think the Atari version on the C sixty four is pretty bad because they try to yes. squeeze the the uh, the horizontal screen in the vertical screen, and then it's like kind of squeezed and squashed, yes. and it's very very slow, like do, 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 yes. do. I don't know, I don't know <laughs> if you ever played it, but. I have. <laughs> I have. Almost every single version of Donkey Kong is horrible, except for the original. Almost every single one. <laughs> I think the Ocean's one, the one that was um, in, 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 in USA, was quite good for the C64. But, but if you that, played... That huh? I have played that one. That one's not bad, actually. That one. I actually never played that back, back in, in the 80s when, when the Commodore first came out. I only played it recently on an emulator, you know, after this whole Donkey Kong thing. So, you know, it, it's funny because the, the only, I, this is something that I had never mentioned before. I never played Donkey Kong Arcade before I saw the King of Kong, never ever. Like not even, not even in the 80s when, when it was all over the place. The, I, I, the only version of Donkey Kong I played before the arcade was the NES version. The um, and I think I played it on the Game Boy. I didn't even play it on NES. I played the NES version on the Game Boy. Uh, you know, I was okay at it, but you don't think you know. It's just like an anything. I'm I'm okay at it. Like, uh, so it wasn't until the King of Kong that I I I I started to play the arcade version. So 
That, that's a little bit of trivia. But the, 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 I think, I think this, this is the line that got most people in the King of Kong playing the arcade version. They, they, all of them, all, all the people in that movie say like Donkey Kong is the hardest game, right? And I, I, when I saw that, I was thinking, you know, I played the NES version. I'm like, it wasn't that hard. Like, what, what's so, and the arcade version looks similar. Look, what's so hard about it? And then when you play the arcade version, you're like, oh, I don't remember it being this hard. <laughs> oh, yes, so, it's, it's yeah, interesting it's, because um, when, when I was starting interviewing Walter Day and so on and Steve Eby, I actually played it in an in, in arcade here in Germany recently. And it was the first time I passed the first stage with only one man. Uh, you know, <laughs> I didn't lose the others. I was like, oh, my God. I'm, uh, first time I'm getting pretty good at this damn hard game, so I know how you feel about it. Yeah. Oh yeah, my very first game of Donkey Arcade, I couldn't get past the first board. I literally could not get past the first. I actually got to the the second to last uh, platform, and I I kept jumping like single barrels, and I was waiting for like an opening to go up, and I was like, there's there's no opening, and then finally you would die some stupid way, like. <laughs> ah. But the, the, the arcade, I mean, this is an interesting, the arcade games in general are harder than the console ports because the the arcade games were meant to only last like a minute or two because they wanted the, they wanted your quarter and they wanted the, the next person to go and eat their quarter. Like, it was generated to make money, not generated to, to make you feel, you know, make you feel good about your gameplay. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, well, actually, an idea. Um, I think you you will you will check out the the um, Donkey Kong Junior conversion of the C C sixty four right. You will play yeah, it on the I'll emulator. Start. Would you be so kind and when you played it for a while, would you write um, a review about your opinion of that conversion? That would be pretty pretty awesome. Then we could publish oh, sure. it in the magazine together <laughs> with an interview in and it, it will be um between june and august so you still have plenty of time to write something and to play it. are you sure you want me to write it because i don't like that young junior <laughs> <laughs> i'll try to be objective but i don't like that young junior <laughs> well maybe I'm... maybe it's better on the cc4 than on the original who knows that's possible i'll tell you steve Weeby will tell you the same thing the, the reason why like the Donkey Kong players don't like Donkey Kong Jr. is because two two of the boards are patternable, and you know, like not a hundred percent patternable, but pretty much patternable. Like it's it's about pattern recognition. Whereas none none of the boards in Donkey Kong, except maybe the spring the elevator stage, none of none of the boards in Donkey Kong are really really patternable. The elevator stage is not patternable either. It's just that it's um. It's sort of the, it's more of a skill than than a, than a strategy board. It's like a skill board, but in Donkey Kong Junior, the the board I don't know the names of the board. There's one board where there's sparks running around the platform. That's that's 100 percent patternable, and then there's one with the birds like uh, the birds dropping eggs. Like that one, that one is not patternable, but you start to recognize patterns in the birds. It becomes you know it becomes like like a pattern. So I don't know. It's more. The other thing about Donkey Kong Jr. is it's more linear. Like in Donkey Kong, you have many choices, right? You can go left, right, up, or down. But in Donkey Kong Jr., it's like a path that you have to follow. So I think that's why most Donkey Kong players aren't too crazy about uh, Donkey Kong Jr., even though they have the same, they share a lot of the same code. But yeah, I'm, I'm not a big fan. It's an all right game. It's not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could write and review anyway. That would be an honor for us to see, like, hey, one of those world record guys actually um, wrote a review about that conversion that was done um, a few months ago. That would be totally great. I'd be glad to do it. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, well, um, you, you have mentioned it. So that means that Donkey Kong Jr. is smarter because it doesn't rely on patterns. But it makes it less enjoyable for um, high score um, people like you. No, Don Kong Jr. relies more on pattern. It's more patternable, Don Kong Jr. Even more. That's... Okay, then I totally misunderstood. I understood the no, no, sorry. Sorry. Donkey Kong is not patternable. Donkey Kong Jr. is more patternable. That, that's what I'm saying. 
Dog yoga is not patternable at all. Like there's, there's, I mean, there's things, there's sort of guidelines, like ways to start off boards. But, you know, after like maybe five seconds to any board, like it becomes random. You know, every board starts out the same, but within five seconds, it's already like completely random. So, uh, whereas Dog Kong Jr., some of the boards are, are completely, it's, you're just executing moves, you know, it's, there's no, you're not thinking, you can go. That's the other thing about Dong Kong Jr. is the point pressing on there is very boring. There's uh, uh, some, I should say, some of the point pressing on there is very boring. Some of them, some of it is just like jumping. We call it jumping sparks. You're just jump, waiting for things to pass by and jumping over. It's it's really really boring. So whereas the point, most of the point pressing on Donkey Kong it involves risks and it, it involves like a, uh, 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 like a like calculated risks. I would say. That's interesting because I saw a YouTube video, um, I don't know if you saw it, you probably saw it, uh, Steve Wiebe's technique and Billy Mitchell's technique and they were mentioning like hammers or jumping on the top of the first uh, yes. stage trying yes. to press for points and the other one is trying to go through as fast as he can but instead more relying on the, on the hammer to make up scores. So what is yes. your technique? Okay, I think that I think that scene they're talking about the probably the the pie or the conveyor stage, right? The 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 pie or conveyor stage. It, it, on that board, it depends on it, it it depends on what the board looks like. Sometimes I'll run up as fast as I can, and sometimes I'll grab the the uh, the hammer and smash pies. The I'll, I'll tell you what it depends on. For, for me, at least, everyone plays the game differently. That that's what that's why this game is so great. Like everyone plays it a little bit differently. The way I play it is first I see how many pies there are on the on the board because the more pies there are, the more um, uh, the more hammer smashes you can get and the more points you can get. Uh, the other thing I look at is the behavior of the fireball. Like I have to see, I have to determine how risky it is for me to just run straight up because running straight up is not always available. So I would say, in fact, it's only available like half or maybe even less than half the time. So. Sometimes I'll grab the hammer just for safety. Like I don't think it's safe to 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 just run up to the top, and I'll just run up uh, for safety. But if you're going for like a world record, like a really 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 high score, then if you see a lot of pies, even if you have the free free pass up, you should probably grab the hammer and get get the points. But the problem is that that's a risk because sometimes when you get the hammer and you smash the pies, and by the time the hammer is gone. Sometimes the fireballs are all over the place, and you, there's no safe passage up anymore. So, it's uh, that that that's like what what I mean about calculate calculated risks. But it, it's it's a it's a judgment call. You know, there's no I don't have any formula or any strict rules. It's just like what I'm feeling. You know, like do do I feel like these points are getting? This is what I mean. You can't calculate it. It's it's almost impossible to calculate. It's just what, what you feel, and it, it comes with experience too. Because sometimes it would be like. Well, last time I grabbed the hammer in this situation, it didn't work out. So maybe I should, you know, just run straight up, that kind of thing. Now the thing is, is it even possible to to always top the high score? I guess at some point you would reach a limit and say, okay, this is like the technically most highest possible point, and you cannot get a higher score. Yeah. The, there, there must be a, the a theoretical maximum score, but nobody's ever going to achieve it. No one's ever going to achieve it because the, the points on it are too random. Like um, even every time you smash a blue, a blue like a fireball, say in Dantan, you get randomly assigned 300, 500, or 800 points. So just that fact alone, like makes the the theoretical high score like almost impossible to get. Because the theoretical high score would mean you have to get 800 points on every single smash, and you probably smash, I don't know, like say 400, 400 blue blue things uh, in in a downtown game. So, and the probably to get get 800 is one in four. So just that fact alone, it, it, it's 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 like it, it's impossible. It, it's it's impossible to get the high score. So any score that's out there is is going to be beatable. The problem is the high, higher it gets, obviously, the, the harder it is going to be. So people are, are guessing right now that the theoretical high score is about 1.23 million or so, maybe even a little higher, but around there. Say, say no more than 1.1 and a quarter million. I don't think anyone thinks more than one and a quarter million is possible.
but like human, humanly possible, one in a quarter million. So the point giving is totally random. Well, just just the smashing of blue blue objects. So meaning like fireballs or blue barrels. Th those points are random. Everything else is is deterministic. Like every if you jump over one barrel, it's always one hundred points. But the fact that the blue objects are random makes the theoretical high score impossible. Just that fact alone. But there's also many other variables. But I'll, I'm just simplifying it so that you understand why it's impossible to get the, the high score. The, the, there are many problems. The other problem is the board can play out in like, like the, you know, millions of ways. Maybe it's probably even like more than millions. It's like millions and millions of ways the board, board can play out. So, and of those millions and millions of ways, there must be one way that, you know, gives you the theoretical best, best score. And they would have to play that way every single time the board comes up. It, it's impossible. It's impossible. It's really, really impossible. I think, I think you get the feeling of what I'm saying, right? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. I mean, I played it a couple of times, but of course, I'm not, I'm not by far as good as you are or anybody else. I, I just end up frustrated after, I don't know, 15 minutes or something. Okay, say, okay, move on to the next game. Uh, this is the thing about Donkey Kong is you, it, it's one of those games where you have to stay with it. It's a very long learning curve. You know, if if you don't like the game, you're 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 not going to be good at it because you're going to play it for a few minutes and you're going to stop. But if you like the game, you're going to keep playing it and you're going to get better, 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 better. Like uh, it's that that's why a lot of the Donkey Kong players they only play Donkey Kong because like it just it, you almost have to be a specialist in Donkey Kong to be good at it. The because it, it takes up it takes up all all it takes up all your time basically. <laughs> That makes me wonder how Billy Mitchell handles it, because he has also high scores on Pac-Man and other yes. games. He is not specialized in Donkey yes. Kong. Yes, that is true. I'm, I'm not saying every Donkey Kong player is a specialist, but a lot, a lot of the Donkey Kong players are like Donkey Kong specialists because of that. So, and also to point out that he is um, producing sauce. You know, Ricky's hot sauce is his famous yes. thing. He's not. He has not really anything to do with engineering or IT <laughs> or computer science. So I think That's he totally stands out, out out of the crowd. You know. That is a very good point. But Steve Levy is like a, a engineering background, and I think he's a math teacher now, right? Like Steve Levy yes. definitely fits the Steve Levy definitely fits the the stereotype. The other thing Steve Levy and I have in common is we we play the drums. I, I actually never discussed that with him. I used to play the drums when I was in uh, when I was in high school, so that is actually something we, we we both have in common. And I think that that might be a rhythm timing thing. Cause there's a lot of timing in, in Donkey Kong too, so. so. So your organism has the drums in in their head and like wow, <laughs> when you play the when you play the game. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's your opinion about the? Um, about the clones of Donkey Kong, I remember the ZZ4 has a lot of clones like Bongo Kong and other things that are almost like Donkey Kong, but they are worse, I guess, in a way. Or what's your opinion? I, I don't like any of the clones. I've played some of those clones on the C64, or I played a lot of the, the clones on MAME or, or in the arcade. I don't like there, there isn't a single clone or port of Donkey Kong that I like. Actually, <laughs> I only like the original, and I'm not saying that just because just to be snobby or anything. I, I played a lot of them before, and they just don't they don't have the same feel. They don't feel as polished. Like Donkey Kong feels like a, a very polished game, whereas like say like Crazy Kong. I don't have you played Crazy Kong before? It's a um, it's one of the I don't know what you would call it, like bootleg -like versions of Donkey Kong. Um, but everything about it is awful. The colors, the sound, everything is the, the feel. Everything is awful about it. Like, <laughs> so but a lot of the but the gameplay is actually similar. But it, it's just I don't know. I can't I can't stand the game. <laughs> I'm sure I would be good at it if I played it, but I. I, I <laughs> yeah, you just don't have the pa um, patience to to stick with it because it's so yeah. bad. Yeah, I see. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I played it. I played it on main once. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> Um, it's interesting because you mentioned you also like to play Mario. Um, yeah. 
Has that to do with Donkey Kong being the first game where Mario appears, or is that totally random? I think, well, I do, it, it is pretty much random, but I do feel like I, I, I'm more of a Nintendo fan than, say, like a, a PlayStation or an Xbox fan. And I think because the, I feel like the, the PlayStation, I, this is a stereotype. Obviously, there are good PlayStation games and good Xbox games. I have, I have all the systems, so it's not, I'm not, um, I'm not, be, I'm not being, uh, what's, what's it called, playing favoritism to one, but I do find, like, the games on the Nintendo focus more on gameplay. Like, the games on the Xbox and the PlayStation, they tend to be, all fit, like, a certain genre. Like, they tend to be, like, first-person shooters, for example. Uh, whereas the games on the Nintendo, there's more variety, you know, there's more, more originality in, in the games that come out on Nintendo. That, that's a complete stereotype. Obviously, complete generalization. Obviously, there, there. I like games on the play, the PlayStation and the Xbox too. But in general, generally speaking, I do tend to like Nintendo games more. So I think it, it is a coincidence, but it's not not a hundred percent coincidence that Donkey Kong happens to be a Mario game. What also is different comparing you to uh, to Steve Weeby, Walter Day, and Billy Mitchell, from what I hear, you're also playing new games on new systems like PlayStation 4 and Xbox One and so on, while the other three um, that, that are famous players, or um, as we know, um, Walter Day being the Twin Galaxies founder, they are, all, they are only interested in vintage computer gaming or video gaming. They are not well, playing any new games, but you do. Yes, th th those guys are a little bit older than me, so, so they... They're a little bit, but by the time console games were popular, say, say when the Super Nintendo came out. The Super Nintendo came out probably when I was in high school. So when I was in high school, they probably, they probably, they probably were in college or graduated college. So they're probably a little bit old for that, you know, for that home console generation. Whereas, like my, I think my like sort of iconic console, home console was the, the Super Nintendo. I mean, to this day, that, that's my favorite favorite console. So, um, I think it's those guys are. I, I don't know how old Steve Weeby is. He's he's probably five years older. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, he's six years older, according to Wikipedia. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so when I when I was in high school, he probably yeah he probably just graduated college. So that, that's about right. And once you graduate college, like you you stop exploring new things. You start like reminiscing about. Uh, the old things. So, uh, I think, yeah, I think I think it has to do with our age more, more than anything. But I have to say, once, once I started playing Donkey Kong, like, my console gaming has, like, suffered, you know. I, I barely play the console games now uh, because of it. Well, I, play, I, play, I play more iOS games just because it's convenient and they're short, you know, like, you can get in and get out, get out. Whereas, uh, like, console games tend to suck you in, you know, it's uh, you can you can stay there for hours. Where whereas iOS games, they're more, more you know you can play for a few minutes when you have time, and then like Candy Crush, you can play like five minutes and then stop. But on the other side, on the console games, you can do a save point, you know, where what That's... you what you can't do on an arcade machine, you cannot <laughs> you cannot um, interrupt, pause, and say, oh, I continue later when I have time and. <laughs> Except on the MAME, of course, you know, but it's not like you, you can be at a Kong off and say, wait, wait, can you wait two minutes? I have to go pee or something. That's not possible, you know? <laughs> that, is, that, is, that is true. <laughs> That's why whenever I, whenever I start a game with Kong, I make sure that the next three hours are going to be free. Because in case I have a good game, the world record now is three hours. So I have to make sure my next three hours are free. That's yeah, but the actually you you brought up an interesting point, which is there since there is no pause button in Donkey Kong, endurance becomes a factor now in world record. It, it's hard to concentrate for for three hours, and all the Donkey Kong players will say the same thing. Like uh, after an hour or two, your brain starts to go numb, and your your eyes start to go numb too. Like uh, eyes start to get fuzzy. Like uh, the last hour or so of gameplay, a lot of you you'll notice. When you're watching other people play, the last hour is actually worse than the first two hours, and it's not—it's not that they're trying to play safer. It's that their brain is starting to get 
get get numb. Yeah, I, I was asking Steve Weeby about it, and he told me he is one of the few players who has no problem with that. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's, it's more true for him, but even in the in the King of Kong, he he has this line where he says, like uh, when he was playing at Fun Spot, when he got the 985 at Fun Spot, uh, he was saying that like his brain was starting to get numb, and the crowd got him through the last hour. Do you, do you remember that line? Oh yes. So, <laughs> even if he's not in, but it may be true that he focuses better than other people. He he does do really well at the Kong Lofts. He he's placed in like the top four, I think. Every every single time, um, but he does he does concentrate uh, 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 really well at the con So maybe he does concentrate better than most people. But I, I don't even think Steve Weeby is immune immune to that. But most of the most of the normal Don Count players, I should say, <laughs> I I had trouble concentrating the last hour. I've had games fall apart completely in the last hour. Like I've been on way ahead of world record pace, and I just cruised the last hour and still broken the world record. And I've had games completely fall apart. You know, even I've gotten to the first, I've gotten to 900,000, say, on my first life, at way over world record pace, and died four times in the next, you know, like 15 minutes. That, that's happened to me a couple of times. So it's, uh, yeah, that, that last hour is, is, uh, is a struggle. And everybody handles different. And, uh... Yes. Well, the, I mean, most people end up just playing safer uh, because the, your your brain just can't react as fast, and that's I, even if I don't intentionally do that, I subconsciously play safer in the last hour or so. So it's like okay, well, even if I don't, if I even if I don't break the world record, at least I didn't lose the game and I reached the kill screen. Well. It, for the people who are going for the world record, they have so many kill screens now that they don't care about kill screens. They they only want the world record. So unless you're playing like live in front of an audience, um, most people will just continue just go go for the world record. They don't they don't care about it. But I can tell you the the world record players they probably have hundreds of kill screens like all of them because uh, in order to reach that level of play, you have to be a kill screen at will. I, I, uh, someone invited me over to a house uh, like a month or two ago. Um, actually, I don't know if you know, you might know him, Chris Coolerist. Do you know who that is? He's the guy who, he turned his bedroom into an arcade. It, it, made, it made the news. Do you know this? No, you know no, him? no, never heard of him. But it's, it's, he sounds like an interesting guy. Maybe you should give me some contact data or something. <laughs> his name is Chris Coolerist. You can uh, Google him. Uh, Chris and then K O U L O U R I S I think, um, but he he lives in New York City. He converted his bedroom. You know, in Manhattan we don't have a lot of space, so he and he wanted a home arcade, so he had to choose between a bedroom and an arcade. So he decided to tear out his bedroom and make it into an arcade. <laughs> And he literally sleeps on the sofa, like on a on a on a futon. He literally sleeps on on the uh, on, on the sofa. So uh, and he lost his fiance because because of that. Like I, apparently his fiance didn't wasn't too happy about that. <laughs> but he got in touch with me a couple of months ago and invited me over. Uh, and actually, he's a very impressive home arcade, especially for Manhattan. Um, but I I hadn't played Duck Town for months uh, at, at that time. And uh, he said, why don't, why don't you play a game? And I, I, I didn't think I could do it, actually, but I kill screened it like, after not playing it for months. So meaning, like, a, what I'm getting at is like a kill screen now is for the world record uh, holders are, 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 are not, it's not a big deal. You, you can get on demand, pretty much, like, even after months of not practice. But if you ask me to get like even a million point game now, I, I probably couldn't do it, like a billion points. But kill screen, I, I could do it any time. So you are that good it, now. Yeah. It sounds like crazy, but to to get to the world like world record level, it's, it's like a kill screen is is you 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 have to be good enough to kill screen on demand. That's that's what I'm getting at. Obviously, not every single game can be a kill screen, but uh, if you're good enough, al almost every single game can be a kill screen. I, I still <laughs> I'm not as popular as Steve Weeby. <laughs>
that's that's your next goal of being as popular. Maybe, maybe making a movie. <laughs> okay. Donkey Kong movie. Why not? Okay. Um. Well, on the other hand, do you fear that that um, that popularity from the movie and so on, that short movie, that is getting too much into your life in a way? I mean, or did you never think of that? Like uh, nothing, nothing to hide in front of the public. In general, I, I have nothing to hide, so I'm not really like a private, private kind of person. Like I don't feel like there's there's really anything to hide. So I didn't mind, you know, when when Alexis first approached me to make the documentary, I should have thought never even crossed my mind. What what I was thinking is, like, why would you be interested in me? Like. At that time, I wasn't the world record holder. I was just some guy that came to arcade to play Donkey Kong. Like I wasn't, nobody knew who I was. So when she first approached me, I was I was thinking, why why would you want to follow me, right? Like around with the camera. So, but I mean, it made more sense after I had the world record that like people wanted interviews or to film me do this that you know, thing. But at that time, I, I literally was nobody. So, I think she she might have the only like the footage, Donkey Kong related footage of me before before I had the world record. Like she had me when I was just nobody. <laughs> but but in that in that short movie, there's also footage about the time you had world record. Yeah, the, it, it, she filmed me before, during, and after the world record. That's that was the the beauty of it. I think we started filming. I don't know. I think in, I would say in the fall. I, I forgot which year. Probably 2008. In the fall of 2008, and then I broke it in February of 2009. It was only a few months. It was only a few months uh, from the time we started filming to the time that I broke the world record. So actually, directly after you, you the the movie was out, you saw the movie and then you got to know her, and so this was pretty fast. Right this after was the movie was published, fast. okay. It was very, very fast, yeah. Well, I started playing, let me see. Do I have my dates messed up? No, the dates are right, I think. The dates are right. Or was it 2000? We started filming sometime in the fall, and by the time uh, February came around, I, I had already broken the world record. I'm not sure which year it was. I have to think about it. If I think about it, I could figure it out. Or maybe we started filming in 2009 and I broke it in 2010. Basically, end of 2009 to beginning of 2010. <laughs> Who knows? It's it's so long time ago. Meanwhile, yeah. um, so one one of the final questions would be, um, what's your experience with with Walter Day and Bill Mitchell and Steve Reby? I mean, did you meet them? Because from the movie. I know that um, Billy Mitchell is portrayed more as the evil revival to, to <laughs> Steve uh, Wiebe, you know, and I, I was Googling on the internet and on the internet, uh, Billy Mitchell was um, stating in interviews that he isn't as evil as the, as the movie made him look like And Even Alexis said, like, he's a really nice guy when, when I met him in person, so Yeah. I, I don't I don't think that the movie portrays the real character of everybody. Well, actually, Billy Mitchell's joke is that the movie is inaccurate because it, it didn't make him look mean enough. That, that's what he'll usually say. But uh, Billy Mitchell actually is a really good guy in, in life. They they kind of edited it out like the They edited it out to make him look bad, definitely. But he has this sense of humor that's easy to edit. You know, like if you edit him a certain way, you can make him look like a, a bad guy. But he's actually a really good guy. So, the the yeah, don't believe everything everything you see see in the movie. And I was actually shocked when I met him the first time. Shocked. And yeah, shocked because he, he's not he's not like I mean he has a sense of he has the same sense of humor that he has in the in the film but his personality is nothing like they portray him in, in the film in the film film they portray him like this evil evil guy he's not like that at all <laughs> but he has that same like sarcastic sense of humor or dry i don't know if sarcastic or dry he has that same kind of sense of humor in in, in the real life as in the film but he's his personality is nothing nothing like that 
in the short movie you are portrayed as a happy guy, always laughing and smiling, and you really seem to be that way. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Alexis did a good guy, a good job of uh, uh, of portraying my personality accurately. I think that was one of the things I told her. I I said there better there. One of the conditions that I agreed to be filmed is there's going to be nothing negative in this film, in this film, and she she agreed to that. She's going to be the, the nothing nothing negative at all in the film. So. And as far as I know, there's nothing negative in the film. <laughs> great, great. So, you would you take part in a bigger movie like King of Kong? Would that be something you you would welcome? If there was, don't know, an, a follow up with the uh, with the happenings nowadays, and maybe you chasing the world record against another um, competitor instead. Uh, so, so you being the next Steve Weeby in another movie. <laughs> Only, only if I can be the good guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Of course, of course, you would be the good guy. Yeah. Um. So, do you think that the retro game hype that started like five years ago actually complemented all this thing for you? in your favor, making it easier for you to gain attention and uh, to gain trust? Well, I think you mean like uh, made it easier for me to, oh, you mean gain trust from like Twin Galaxies or? Oh yeah, well, or, or, or people, you know, better understanding what this Donkey Kong is about because, you know, in the last five years, actually people are going to their ethics and they are putting out the Commodore 64 or yes. they are, I don't know, they are Nintendo or something and relive their childhood. Yes. And, um, and I remember in my childhood in the 90s, uh, you, it was like, why do you spend time with electronic trash? Move to modern <laughs> things, you know? And now people go back to their childhood. Now people go back to the 80s and 90s and relive that thing. So I think... Um, it must be in in your favor because when when you when you did the world record on Donkey Kong, it was exactly that time where this retro hype started again. Yeah, but I think it's I, this is kind of a circle thing. It's, it's because of this retro revival that I started playing Donkey Kong in the first place. You know, what I mean, like it's because of the King of Kong. If I'd never seen the King of Kong, I would have never played Donkey Kong probably ever in my life. So. Um, I think because of the retro revival that I, I started playing Donkey Kong, but I mean, in a way, I, I guess it helped because there, it wasn't just me. There are a lot of other people breaking uh, 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 world records, like sort of out of the woodwork, like people, names that people never heard of, you know, like breaking very, like very classic uh, ar arcade game world records. So. I, th I think I guess I guess it would I guess it did help because it, it kind of opened this world of class gaming to bigger than just the twin people who were already on Twin Galaxies. That there were, it was just more it was more than me that was just coming out and breaking breaking world records. So I, I guess I guess it did help. Which makes it also harder for you and other people to to well to win in a new game or break a world record because you have more competition nowadays. Now that you have yeah, I, more public awareness, I, I don't mind. Like I, I think the more the merrier. Like uh, if I was playing Donkey Kong by myself, it wouldn't be any fun, right? Like uh, I wouldn't have any anyone to play with or any anyone to compare strategies with, right? I think the more the merrier. So I don't need to hold a world record forever. That's not my goal in life. Like my my main goal is just to play for fun. So and and. Like competing, com competing is fun too, right? Like uh, uh, getting a bunch of friends together and you know, pl playing against each other. Even if you lose, it's still fun. So yeah. it's true because you have your friends, and, and this make this making it uh, entertaining for you. Yeah. 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 You know, the the, the Kong offices have almost become like a like a reunion for the for the Donkey Kong community because we we live all over the place, you know, all over the country, all over the world. So. The the Kong office has become almost a, it's more of a it's almost more of a social event than a competition you know because we all get together we only see each other once a year so and even 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 if well for Kong three even though I lost I still had a lot of fun and 
Kung Up 2, I have to say, Kung Up 2, I put a lot of pressure on myself to win. So actually, when I lost Kung Up 2, I actually was feeling pretty ups- I don't I don't know what the right word is, like disappointed or upset. But Kung Up 3, I went in with a different mentality. Kung Up 3, I put no pressure on myself to win. Obviously, I wanted to win, but I was thinking if I, did, if I don't win, then it's fine. Like, as long as you have fun. So... Uh, Kung Up 3 came in, I think, third, and I was still, I was okay with it. I was, I was still happy, still had fun. Hmm. Um, one thing I would like to know, and I didn't ask that anybody before, I saw there are also a lot of people saying this is all staged and fake. Uh, and if you, <laughs> if you look on YouTube, there are actually movies made out of that topic saying this whole <laughs> thing is a charade and it's fake and so on, you know? Wait, wait like Hank Chen is fake or? <laughs> no, I, like, mean, I mean this, you know, I mean there were other people having the world records before or I don't know. I mean, have you ever heard of that? You, oh, you mean before, oh, before Billy you mean? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I was doing the research. I I found I found uh, other videos, uh, and um, I, actually, I even got one here saying "King of Con," you know. And this documentary uh -huh. is is saying, well, it's all fake and not really true, and <laughs> it's just to hide people. So, what's your opinion about that? No, that well, that that particular I I've actually seen King of Khan. That you did? that yes, that I know the guy who made that film actually. Um, what he what what he's saying is that, that that's more about Pac Man than about Donkey Kong. Well, it's what it's said, called King of Khan anyway. It's right. <laughs> <laughs> but what he's saying in that film is that Billy, even though Billy Mitchell had the first perfect Pac Man. That there were actually first that there were actually perfect Pac Mans before him, but what 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 is true is Billy Mitchell had the first uh, Twin Galaxies verified perfect Pac Man. That that's true, but what 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 the film is saying is that there were perfect Pac Mans before him, so that like Billy Mitchell isn't really the the true like king of king of Pac Man, I guess, um, but the I mean, the, in terms of Donkey Kong, like, I don't know, everything is pretty real. Like, I'm, I'm real. <laughs> like, I wasn't hired by... <laughs> I'm not an actor. <laughs> I really... This is the machine I broke the world record on, like... <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting because I also spoke about that topic with um, Steve Reeby. And you know the part from the movie where he, where they actually going to his garage and looking up the machine, and he told me on the phone that, in the, in the at the beginning to avoid such such a thing, he even asked the seller if 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 there was um, any difference in this combo circuit board from Donkey Kong Jr. and Donkey Kong on the same circuit board compared to the single machines um, and then there was then we're making up this um, this thing in the movie that actually the person who sold the machine is an enemy of Twin Galaxies so yes. this thing not only has shy but also some re some some evil sides and war and stuff and yes. that's totally, I don't know. I mean, in the end, it's just a game, right? Yeah, well, <laughs> it's, yes, it's just a game, but people take it, like, uh, very, very, very seriously. Like, very, very seriously. I think it's especially this game because there, there's so much, contra there, historically, there's so much controversy surrounding this game. So I think that's why for this particular game, people take it very, very seriously. Because people... Um, you know, the, because part, partly because of the whole Steve Weeby thing the, and the whole, you know, the enemy sold him the board and this and that. Like, there's just too much controversy. No, no one wants the, no, no, no one, no one, no one wants the, that controversy to happen again. So, yeah, th this game receives special, special attention. But the, that, that is, I, you probably discussed this with Steve Weeby, but, but the first, his first Twin Galaxy submissions were not on an original Donkey Kong board. And I've played on that 
on that board before. Um, and it, it plays, I can tell you, it plays pretty much exactly the same. The sounds are a little bit different, but it plays exactly the same. So, but I can, I can definitely understand why Twin Galaxies uh, rejected those submissions that, uh, you know, you don't want, like theoretically, there could be like microsecond differences in, in things. So I think, I think that that's okay. Like that was probably the right move to um, disqualify those scores. From what Steve told me, the main difference was that they used the same sound of Donkey Kong Jr. for the original Donkey Kong. Yeah, exactly. Probably it's, the same. It's probably the same sound drum set or something. Exactly. It's they, they're using Donkey Kong Jr. sounds to make Donkey Kong sounds. So it, it sounds a little bit different. It's like higher pitched or something. Higher um, pitched. That is what he said, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, the, I mean, you wouldn't notice it unless you spent like a thousand hours on Donkey Kong. <laughs> yeah, it's, it probably is nothing like, oh, well, most people will not know, not notice this anyway, so just let's uh, spare that, that extra sound drum. We don't need that. We right. just take the other one. I guess right. that is how the board kind of um, works. It's probably it's like a ROM, ROM uh, um, switch or something between the different set of ROMs. No, they, I think it's, 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 um, it's soft. You can switch it via software. I think you just hit player one, player two at the same time, and it switches between the different ROMs. So it's basically two ROMs on the same chip. That, that's how I think it works. It's not like two different boards or two different. It, it's the same processor also. It runs on the same processor. So it's basically just one big ROM that has both ROMs in it. Ah, so it's, it's even some kind of maybe emulation or something? No, it's not emulation. It's it's on a real it's on a real board, and it's on a real the same processor even. It's just that it's two ROMs combined into one. Like they took the code from two different games and put it into one one ROM. That that's probably what they did. So you you so you seriously analyzed it. It sounds so what? Like you you analyzed it. It sounds like it. Well, I, I've seen the, the board, like I've seen the, it, it's called the Double Donkey Kong board. I, I've seen the Double Donkey Kong board. It it's only has one set of ROM chips, so the, it, it must be they combine the code from two different ROM sets into one. Like, there's no, yeah, there's no switch. It, it's a software switch. That's what I'm saying. It's a software switch. Yeah, the, <laughs> well, part, part of being a Donkey Kong player is, is knowing the hardware, actually, because the, Especially now with the verifications, I think the new the newest Twin Galaxies is more peer reviewed verification. But the last two or so generations of Twin Galaxies, they were very very strict about the recording. So I had to learn I had to learn what all the different parts of a machine are because you have to take it apart every time you break the world record. Like it's you have to know. I mean, it's easier to take it apart than a PC, so it's not not that bad. But you have to learn what all all the parts are. Oh, so you really have to do serious analyzing. Yes. <laughs> but I guess this, um, you know, this VH, uh, that VHS disturbing things that was also made in the movie a topic, you know, that is not really um, um, a topic nowadays anymore because they don't use VHS cassettes anymore. Uh, I mean, well, I. By the time I was recording, I, I was doing digi digital recordings. But that, that, that's a whole other issue is like the VHS recordings, they have skips, you know? And it's not anyone's fault, it's just the, the way it is. Like sometimes it skips or sometimes it, it, you get static or blurry. So, uh, but all my recordings were digital, so that, that wasn't an issue for me. You, you, know, you know how to work around it. Since, since, you, since you are in computer science, a profession, you know what to do to avoid such uh, problems. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you're playing, you're playing an old game, but other equipment is uh, high-tech. and really yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, so this, this would be all my questions for now. Thanks again for taking the time, right? And keep in touch. Okay. okay, take care. Yeah, bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. And um, yeah, well, so tell us a bit about how you actually got the idea of making the Dr. Kong 
a movie of um, Hank Sheehan, I think was his name, who, huh? who did the who did one of those world records in 2010 and 2011. I mean that's quite quite special. Um, has it anything to do with the fact that there was earlier movie about that about uh, Billy Mitchell had, and Steve Beebe? Uh, no, but I had seen that movie before. I went to um, film school for documentary filmmaking, and actually, I don't think I watched it in school. But around that time, I was watching you know tons of documentaries, so I saw it then, and I really liked that movie. But this was years after I was working um, in a bar. Um. In 2004 or three, I guess it was, I got approached by a toy company to make the hardware for a Commodore 64 joystick. I imagine there's probably a, oh, there it is, my baby. <laughs> yeah, um, D64 direct to TV, right? DTV. Yes. To, to become a, a computer engineer. And how did you start at Commodore? Yeah, I was uh, I was in the U.S. going to school. Then I went back to Japan after I finished my school. Then. Um